Hello, saints, peace, love, and grace of Christ Jesus be with all of you. I hope everybody's doing wonderful out there today. Looking at the screen in front of us, we see some highlights of Paul's ministry. From 34 AD, when he's confronted and he's converted by our Lord Jesus. Paul is shown a mystery, the revelation of the gospel of grace. A body of believers of both Jews and Gentiles. Paul is told that he will be a minister, the minister, the apostle to the Gentile nations. Then over a course of 15 or 16 years, much has happened throughout this time. Paul spends over 10 years in Roman Tarsus, Gentile territory, preaching to those Gentiles. He returns to Antioch and he goes on his first major journey a journey that takes him throughout the region where all the Jews had scattered because of the persecution that took place in Jerusalem now the most important thing to understand at this point is that there's a transition taking place the book of Acts is all about the transition from the Mosaic laws the last days of the kingdom gospel transitioning to the dispensation of grace the mystery that's hid within God since before the foundation of the world and as I've explained to you previously while this transition is taking place the Apostles are still preaching the kingdom gospel back in Jerusalem they're preaching faith plus keeping the laws okay you see all these Jews that fled Jerusalem and scattered throughout all those different countries fled only knowing the mosaic law system some of them believed in Jesus as their Messiah and most didn't nevertheless they were all Jews and they all scattered to from the persecution uh, in Jerusalem and they both believed heavily in keeping the laws and this is the biggest obstacle that Paul has at this point it's convincing his Jewish brethren, his kinsmen, that salvation is by believing on Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection without the Mosaic law system. And this obstacle is what gets Paul in trouble all throughout his ministry. So Paul's mission is to go find all these Jews, his kinsmen, to tell them about this new gospel that Jesus revealed to him this mystery Paul's entire mission his purpose is to tell the scattered Jews all about Jesus Christ that he is indeed the Messiah that was prophesied in the scriptures and that he died was buried and rose again the third day to fulfill the scriptures to fulfill the prophecies the gospel that we find in 1 Corinthians 15 1 through 4 also you can read all about the scattered Jews in the book of James James writes to this specific group of people in the last days the Messianic Jews the ones that believe in Jesus Christ as their Messiah it's also important to understand what Paul's thinking in his in his mind at this point he has no idea that there's going to be an extra 2,000 years of grace as far as Paul is concerned he has to spread this new gospel as quickly as possible because he believes that they're in the last days he believes the rapture is about to happen and Daniel's week is about to begin that's what he's thinking that's what's going through Paul's mind during this time period so Paul's traveling one trip after another trip to spread this revelation that Jesus shared with him earlier on and you can get a good synopsis of what Paul's been doing for these 15 years by reading the book of Galatians Galatians explains everything that Paul's been dealing with concerning the little flock of believers the Messianic Jews and the rest of the scattered Jews how they were wrapped up in the Mosaic law system much of their downfall is this yoke of bondage that laws bring upon them works earning their way into heaven keeping the 600 plus laws of the old covenant 
under the Mosaic law system. Paul warns them about adding works to the gospel of grace. Faith plus circumcision. Faith plus good works. Faith plus temple worship. Faith plus keeping the laws of Moses to earn or keep their salvation. Another gospel. Paul calls this another gospel. Paul warns them sternly in Galatians 1. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. You see, Paul says it's not another gospel because they did believe in Jesus Christ, but they were adding on to it. But they were perverting the gospel by adding on to uh, the gospel by with works. Paul continues in verse 8 in Galatians, But though we, or another, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that ye have received, let him be accursed. Paul took the simplicity and purity of the dispensation of grace very seriously. This new gospel, building a body of believers of both Jews and Gentiles through faith and belief on Jesus Christ and what he did for the world. He took this very seriously, and for a good reason, I might add, and he warns them not to add anything to his gospel. The gospel that he taught them and he talked to them about. So now we're in the year right around 50 AD. And Paul has just left for his second missionary journey. Now looking at the map on the screen, Paul begins his journey from Antioch all the way to the right. He travels north through Tarsus, okay, this is the region of Cilicia, back through Galatia, the region of Derb and Lyconia and Lystra, Iconium, then north to the second place, the second Antioch, remember there's two Antiochs, and he heads east. First, he visits all the little assemblies that he'd established on his first mission in that area, and now he's heading to new territory establishing more believers, more assemblies along the way. Now, one thing I want to tell you before we start reading Acts 16 is the Jews here, are they're, they're very law-minded, okay? Continuing to follow the Mosaic laws. They want nothing to do with Paul or his lawless gospel. And frankly, that's the reason why Paul almost gets killed in every city that he visits. Paul's gospel of grace, the gospel of today, is faith without the law and the Jews just couldn't they couldn't comprehend anything not having the laws attached to it and they persecuted Paul greatly almost killing him putting him in jail all because Paul's gospel was without the laws without works and most Jews just couldn't understand that they were blind to everything that Paul was trying to reveal to them okay and we start here in chapter 16 of Acts in our study in verse 1. Then came he, Paul, to Derb and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus. The, this is the same Timothy of the book of First Timothy and Second Timothy. The son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess and believed. But his father was a Greek. So here we're introduced to somebody very important. Timothy. This is the same Timothy that Paul writes the, the book of 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy to. The same Timothy who Paul writes 2 Timothy 2.15 to. Now something unique concerning Timothy is that Timothy is very young. He's a young man. Also, his mother is Jewish and his father is a Gentile. And under the Jewish laws, if one parent is a Jew and the other parent is a Gentile then the child is automatically considered to be Jewish we see this in 2nd Timothy who his mother is if we turn to 2nd Timothy 1 5 
When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother, Lois, and thy mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Timothy's mother, Eunice, most likely became a believer back in the first journey of Paul, when Paul visited Lyconia in his first time around, his first journey through that area, where they almost killed Paul. If you remember, they almost killed him by stoning him in Lystra. Now, Timothy will become a very significant person in Paul's life. So much so that Paul considers Timothy his very own son. He loves Timothy very much. So we continue on in verse 2, speaking of Timothy here, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters. For they knew all that his father was a Greek. Now remember earlier when I said, if a child is born with one parent that's Jew and the other parent that's Gentile, that child is considered Jewish. But you see, Timothy, had he's a young man and he never been circumcised. And the Jews didn't respect Timothy whatsoever because of that. Okay, Jews are very law-minded. According to them, Timothy wasn't following the laws. So he was an outcast, okay, at this point. And the only reason why Paul had Timothy circumcised was so the doors would be open for Timothy. And the Jews would recognize him. They would listen to what he had to say concerning the gospel of grace. And we just read in the last chapter, in chapter 15, about the Jerusalem council. Remember, they, did, they determined circumcision was not necessary for believing Gentiles. So Timothy, isn't, he's not getting circumcised here because he had to. Paul had him circumcised so the Jews would listen to the gospel of grace being preached so that they would respect Timothy's message. Now remember when Paul said, To the Jews I became a Jew. To the Gentiles I became a Gentile. To the Romans I became a Roman. I'm paraphrasing here. But Paul did whatever he had to do to get people to hear this gospel. In order to understand why he did that, you have to keep in mind that there is still a transition taking place here. There's a small window of time when both kingdom mosaic law systems and the gospel of grace are intertwined. Both systems are taking place during this time simultaneously, but only for a short period of time. Peter's kingdom program is dwindling, is decreasing, and Paul's dispensation of grace is on the rise, is on the increase, it's becoming dominant. But that, it takes time for that. It doesn't happen overnight. And we'll see that it took over 30 plus years for Paul to complete. However, we can see a remnant of the kingdom gospel being practiced today. The Hebrew Roots Movement is exactly what they were doing in Galatia. You read the book of Galatians and you'll see exactly what the Hebrew Roots Movement is caught up in today. Paul calls it another gospel. The Hebrew Roots Movement believe, they believe in Jesus is the Messiah, but they add works and laws to prove themselves worthy. The very same problem that Paul was dealing with back in his ministry in Galatia. And keep in mind, Peter and the other 11 apostles are back in Jerusalem. They don't travel for the most part. They're not traveling like Paul is. They're, they're staying in Jerusalem. They're not traveling. The 12 apostles are all back in Judea, in Jerusalem, in Syria, preaching the kingdom gospel to the Jews. They're not preaching the, to the Gentiles. Remember that Jesus commanded the apostles to stay in Jerusalem and find the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay, so moving on. Paul has Timothy circumcised. Now we're in verse 4. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and the elders which were in Jerusalem. Now, these decrees here, remember, the letter that they drafted up in Jerusalem at the council, that there would be no circumcision for the Gentiles. 
and they were to abstain from blood, fornication, strangled animals, and so on. Verse 5, And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia and their region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. After they were come to Mycenae, they assayed, they tried to go into Bithynia. But the Spirit suffered them not. Again, the Holy Spirit told them not to go there. Now looking at the map, notice how Paul bypasses Asia here. He goes north. Then he cuts across straight to Traus. Okay? The Holy Spirit forbids Paul to go into Asia at this point. In verse 8, And they passing by Mycia came down to Traus. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he'd seen this vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from trials, we came with a straight course to Samothracia and the next day to Neapolis and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days. Okay, so now they're in Philippi. They traveled across the seas from Traus all the way through Samothracia, all the way bypassing all that area, and they end up in a city of Philippi. In the year is right around 50 AD to 51 AD. Now, looking at our trusty map once again, Paul gets a vision about going to Macedonia. Notice Paul is in Traus here, okay? He travels through Traus. He gets this vision to sail across the water from Traus over to the other side. And we see Thrace to the north here on the, on the map. And the region of Macedonia is straight across the water. They sail across to Samothracia, then over to Neapolis, then they trek by land to Philippi. Now we're deep into Roman territory. Philippi is governed by the Romans and the Roman laws. And another interesting point is in Philippi at this time, there's no synagogue in, in the city of Philippi. You see, in order to establish a Jewish synagogue, there had to be at least 10 Jewish men. But there isn't any. So the woman, the women, would meet down by the river to worship and to pray. And as we move uh, in closer into these areas, there's also an increase of idol worship. This is an area filled with idols. Remember, the Greece area, if you can recall, uh, if you recall Zeus and Apollos and Hercules and all these Greek myths and all this stuff, that's what's going on in this area. So, verse 13, And on the Sabbath we went out of the city by a riverside, where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, of the city of Thyteria, Th Thyteria which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. So we see Lydia and all her household here being baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ Jesus. Keep in mind, Lydia is a Gentile. Okay? She's, a, she's in Greek. Uh, in Greece and she, she, she loves the Lord and she meets Paul Paul is praying and uh, she hears what he's saying and everything and she becomes a, a believer in Christ Jesus the death burial resurrection and she is baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ and it came to pass as we went to prayer a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us which brought her master much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul 
and us, and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which showed unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee, in the name of Jesus Christ, to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains were gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers. People often ask me if there's any signs and wonders today in the body of Christ. Well, here we just saw the power of the enemy. A woman possessed by a demon able to tell the future. And there be many other possessed that, that were possessed by demons that are able to even heal and speak in tongues and act you know as if they're in the body of Christ but is it is the enemy working through them they come as an angel of, of, of light they come as righteous ministers but they are filled with the enemy we're told that during the end days in Daniel's week the enemy will counterfeit God's signs and wonders to mislead people to deceive them the deception that's going to cause them to fall away from God's truth. It's important to note that the enemy is very capable of performing miracles to mislead people from ever learning the truth. And we see these things happening all over the world today. The people are angry because Paul cast out this demon that was foretelling the future through possessing this woman. And these men were making money off of her ability to tell the future. She's a fortune teller. That's what she is. And she just lost her powers. And now they're about to lose their business, their money. And they're upset at Paul. Verse 20. And brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. And teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Verse 24, Who, having received such a charge thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in stocks the inner prison being max uh, super max okay they were they were very very deep into the prison and they were watched 24 hours a day verse 25 and at midnight paul and silas prayed and sang praises unto god and the prisoners heard them and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed and the keeper of the prison awakened out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open he drew out his sword and would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had been fled but Paul cried with a loud voice saying do thyself no harm for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Now, was anybody saved at this point? No. Not until after they were told the gospel Jesus Christ death burial and resurrection look at what Paul does next in verse 32 and they spake unto him the, the, the jailer the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house what's the word of the Lord the gospel before anyone got saved Paul had to speak the word of the Lord the gospel Jesus Christ death burial resurrection if you look at Romans 10 real quick, verse 14, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? 
And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? That's why we read in Acts 16.31, Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. In the next verse, in 32, we see Paul explain the gospel to them. Then they were baptized by the Holy Spirit. Gentiles were added to the body of Christ. In verse 33, And he took them the same hour of night of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Now it's important to keep in mind here. The jailer and his family were Roman Gentiles. There were no synagogues in this area. There is no Jewish rule of law in this area. Or what we know as Mosaic, the Mosaic law system. Philippi was completely under Roman rule. A few years later, when Paul would write to the Corinthians, he reminds them of what he taught them during that time. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Now look at verse 14. For the body is not one member but money, but many. Then Paul would write back to the Ephesians from Roman prison, going even further to remind them years earlier concerning this baptism. Look at Ephesians 4. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Not two, one. This is the baptism by the Holy Spirit. When you are saved, added to the body of Christ, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit. You are sealed. The Holy Spirit is your earnest. It is the promise. It is the down payment. It is done. That is when Jesus pays for you for, you're forever. You're, you're paid for. There's no turning back. You are sealed in Christ Jesus. And by his faith are you kept sealed. It is by his faith that you are kept sealed. It is your belief that you are saved. You understand? So if it's the faith of Jesus Christ that keeps you sealed, then you cannot lose salvation. Because the Lord will not lose you. It is his faith. And it is your belief on him and what he did for you that saves you. And we'll get into a study on that later on in the future. In verse 6, One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Now back to Acts 16.33, it says, And was baptized, he and all his, straightway. It means they were all baptized into the body of Christ, being sealed by the Holy Spirit immediately, all at once. Remember, we're in Roman territory here. These are Gentiles. Okay, there's no Jewish law in the system. There's no system. There's no synagogue. There's no baptism by water in this area. They were sealed by the Holy Spirit straightway, all at once, immediately. All right, we're seeing the dispensation of grace growing here. The kingdom gospel is declining, and the body of Christ of both Jews and Gentiles is on the rise. We're seeing the transition is, is in progress here. Verse 35, and when it was day, the magistrates sent to the sergeants, saying, Let those men go. Let Paul and Silas go. And the keeper of the prison told this, saying to Paul, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said unto them, They have beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans, and have cast us into prison. And now do they thrust out us out pri pri privately, privately, in private, in secret? Nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. Paul's saying, look, they put us in prison. You tell them to come get us out of prison. Okay? Verse 38. And the sergeants told these words unto the magistrates, and they feared when they heard that they were Romans. Ah. And they came and besought them and brought them out and desired them to depart out of the city. 
They want him gone. Just get him out of our hair so we don't get in trouble. Verse 40, and they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia again. They went back to Lydia's house. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. They depart Philippi. See, these Roman jailers could have gotten into big trouble for what they did to Paul because Paul was a Roman citizen. He's a dual citizen, both Roman and Jewish. It was against the law for the Romans to treat other Romans with such harshness. They had to go through the legal system like we do in the United States today. You know, if you get charged with something, you're presumed innocent before guilty. They have to prove that you did something wrong in, in the most situations. Okay? Without first going through the legal system, they could have gotten big trouble, especially because Paul's Roman. So they had to follow the Roman legal protocol that dictated whether or not a fellow Roman citizen should be beaten or even imprisoned. Now, these jailers are terrified that Paul is going to turn on them and he's going to turn them in to their Roman authorities. And they'd get into big trouble. So they just want Paul to go away quietly, like nothing happened, and they don't stir up the hornet's nest, so to speak. They let Paul and Silas go. And Paul and Silas, they go back to Lydia's house to bid them farewell. They go back to Lydia's house to say, bye, we're leaving. Okay. And in the next chapter, Paul will continue on his journey to the south, preaching the gospel of grace, adding people to the body of Christ, establishing believers all along the way, down through uh, Thessalonia, Corinth, Athens, all the Achaia region. They're deep in the Greece Gentile territory now and they're also deep in the idol worship territory so we just saw the early establishment of the church at Philippi Paul will come back later on in the future in a future trip but if you want to get a sense of what's taking place in Philippi read the book of Philippians right of course Paul didn't write the book of Philippians for another 10 years down the road when he's in, in prison in Rome but the book of Philippians gives you an idea of what Paul had to go uh, go through and contend with on his first and second visitation to Philippi throughout that area. So reading Philippians might give you a sense of what happened during that time period. The year is right around 51, 50 to 51 AD. Paul is about to write the book of Thessalonians during this time, but only after he gets down to the city of Corinth. He writes Thessalonians from the city of Corinth, and uh, he'll, he'll have to write back to the Thessalonians, and we'll get a very good sense of what mysteries he taught the Thessalonians during that time. There's a lot of rapture verses in Thessalonians and Paul was teaching the Harpazo during that time and we're gonna see that. The rapture is one of the one of the mysteries. So we're, we're jumping ahead into the future here but if you read first, first Thessalonians Paul mentions something important concerning what he had been teaching throughout all that journey. First we see Paul uh, he talks about his imprisonment at Philippi then we just read in, uh, we read in 1 Thessalonians 2, but even after that, we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Then something even more interesting, in back in chapter 1 of 1 Thess, in verse 10 or 9, for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Verse 10 we read, which delivered us. It's a done deal. Delivered means it's done. Delivered us. Here we see a reference to the mystery of the rapture. In verse 10, it doesn't say will deliver us or is delivering us or might deliver us if we do works. It, or, you know, or maybe if we believe, it doesn't say anything like that. It says delivered. It's a done deal. It's already been done. It's a guarantee. Remember, the mindset that everyone is in during this period of time is that they don't know anything about the extra 2,000 years into the future. They all believe they're about to enter Daniel's 70th week, the day of the Lord, and so does Paul. Paul's thinking the same thing. He's expecting the rapture to happen at any moment. That's what he's thinking. 
He's going through all these areas in Philippi, Thessalonia, Corinth, Corinth, and all these areas. He's telling, look, we're about to get caught up. That was part of the mystery. So he's teaching that they are delivered from the day of the Lord, from the wrath. It's a done deal. Part of the mystery shown to Paul many years earlier. Remember, Paul had been caught up, raptured to heaven. Many, many years prior to this, Paul was raptured to heaven very early on in his ministry. He was given a glimpse of what the rapture would be like and also shown uh, he was shown things in heaven that he couldn't talk about. And we talk about that in chapter 14. So in 1 Thess 1.10, which Paul will write after he visits Thessalonians in 52 AD, we see a glimpse of Paul's early teachings of the Harpazo already, delivering the body of Christ from the wrath of God. And Paul writes about the rapture again in chapter 2. If you look at 1 Thess 2.19, For what is our hope, our joy, or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. So we see a glimpse of what Paul was revealing early on in his ministry. Even the harpazo that we look forward to today, right? In closing, one thing to keep in mind. Paul's entire ministry can be seen in the book of Acts. All of his books were written during this period of history that we're studying right now. Everything from Romans through Philemon was written during the 30 plus years that is in the book of Acts. So, in studying the book of Acts, we can see the mindset that Paul was in when he wrote those books, why he wrote them, what he was talking about, what he was teaching, and so on. All things we need to answer when we rightly divide the word of God, the word of truth. And one mystery that was kept from Paul was that there was going to be an extra 2,000 years before the second coming. This extension wasn't revealed to Paul. So, as far as Paul's concerned, the rapture was at hand. He, at any moment, Daniel's week was about to commence. Everything we read in the Old Testament, the four Gospels, Hebrew through Revelation, was about to take place. It is taking place. Paul was in the middle of it. He's waiting for the rapture. So, let's review real quick. In this study, in chapter 16, we saw how Timothy works with Paul and Silas how Timothy was uh, circumcised because his mother was Jewish, his father was Greek, but as a child born to a Jewish and Greek parents, he's considered Jewish, and Paul had him circumcised so the Jews would accept him, and Timothy could preach the gospel of grace to them, to save them. And Paul's vision about uh, a man in Macedonia. Paul gets a vision from Macedonia, so he travels there. He meets a woman in Philippi, Lydia, that is a believer. She gets baptized by the Holy Spirit. And a female slave that was possessed by an evil spirit. And we also saw the prison officer when Paul went to jail with Silas. How the prison officer is added to the body of Christ. After hearing the gospel, his and his family. The Roman officials apologized to Paul and Silas. They let him go. So that's it for chapter 16. Until next chapter, chapter 17. Peace, love, grace of Christ Jesus be with all of you. Lord willing, I'll see you on the next study.